Good evening. Um, I like the tan. As we're getting warmed up, hopefully not only physically but spiritually too, for a um, Gimel Thomas gathering, reflecting on 30 years and what it means to us. The power of one. First, I'd like all to please take something to eat. Please take a seat. Make yourself comfortable. Take something to drink, whether it's a soft drink or a l'chaim. We'll get started in a few short moments. As we start, I wanted to mention that tonight is an evening... Um, this evening's, no problem, this evening's Fablingen is a project of Chabad of the Five Towns, Chabad of Far Rockaway, and Chabad of Hewlett Neck Old Woodmere getting together for this uh, most suspicious day of Gimel Tammuz. I do want to take a moment to thank First and foremost, someone who's very near and dear, as we also reflect on my father-in-law of blessed memory. I wanted to thank Dr. and Mrs. Rosen for everything. No words. Can't be specific because there are too many specifics. It's like every moment you're complete and total dedication to my in-laws well-being and you're being the vessel of the miracle of his health in general and especially in the last three and a half years Yashakayach Tove Aleichem Brocha and Hashem should repay you many times over with all Brocha Begash Mishabaruchnis as the Rebbe once told the Shliach when he showered him with Brocha and he concluded in the Iker what is the culmination of all Brochas Chesidus Nachas from the Kinder so Hashem should help that you should have all the brachas and the ikir, chesidish nachas from the kinder. I also want to thank my brother, Chazen Mendel, who is here this evening to lead us with chesidish and igunim. Thank you. And looking forward for many more. I'm at the club. It's not mitzah shvoche. Michael Sick and Six Caterer, as soon as he heard there would be an event this evening, Michael immediately responded. What can I do to help? And he gave generously. Thank you so much, Michael. I want to thank Jerusalem Florist for this evening and for every event at Chabad throughout the year. And I want to thank our speakers of this evening, Rabbi Rali Resnick, the Shliach to Tri Valley, California, Rabbi Lazar, Chief Rabbi of Russia. And Mr. Ivan Silverman, who will be addressing us this evening, thank you so much for allowing yourself to come up and share a moment, a few moments. I do want to mention that last year, Rabbi Taub addressed us with the theme of there's no, Jew, no small Jew. And we spoke then about a family that my father-in-law had this chus, the merit to bring from the island of Korosa, bring them to New York, and in essence, bring them to Yiddishkeit and to Chesidus. By divine providence, Rabbi Taub's son married their daughter, as was mentioned last year. My father-in-law officiated at their wedding, and that was the last wedding he officiated at outside of immediate family. So it's an amazing, you say, closing of a full circle of no small Jew. We'll now get started with some nigunim. I want to thank Itzik for playing the music, Mendel Gaisinski for photography, Yashakayach. And I want to thank all who helped in their unique way to 
help cover this event. There's still many opportunities. If you wish to sponsor, it would be greatly appreciated.
Good evening. Can I want to mention that this is a uh, joint project, Chabad of the Five Towns, Chabad of Yule Neck, Old Woodmere, and Chabad of Rockaway, as we reflect 30 years of Gimel Tammuz, and the theme of the evening is the power of one. Let me start with saying L'chaim, as it is with tradition by Echsidish of Ablingen, L'chaim, L'chaim. We're privileged to have here with us our guest speakers, Rabbi Rali Resnick, Chief Rabbi Tarasha, Rabbi Beryl Lazar, Mr. Ivan Silverman. Last week, our family observed Shleishim 30 days of my father in law, Harav Meishi Yehuda ben Raf Tzvi passing. And that what's one of the reasons why we chose the theme, the power of one, because he exemplified in his life a deep iskashrus to the Rebbe, a deep soul connection, if you can say, to the Rebbe, which he materialized and activated 24-7. 
He was one person with one cell phone, no secretary, the same cell phone that 5,000 Shluchim knew to call him. That was the same number that his wife called him. My mother in law was lying gesund. Same cell phone number that we all called him. And that was the same number where he picked up every call, and for that matter, returned every call. And that was the phone that he would call us as children, wherever we were, no matter what it was. We knew, and we, he uh, made us realize that we as individuals counted, and for that matter, every shliach around the world knew that they counted, and they knew whether in good days or in better days, they would call him. It's not, by no coincidence that when the shliach had a baby boy and the bris took place during the shiva observance of my father-in-law, he gave him a name for my father-in-law. He says because he was like a father to him. And therefore he named him that way. So it is Gimel Tammuz. It is a time that we reflect on how the Rebbe encouraged and empowered each and every single individual, the power of one. So at this time, I'd like to ask you to turn to the screen for a moment to watch a clip of the Rebbe. Und da sein ein und eins gemacht habe, soll er wissen sein, dass es rettet sich, wenn ich wüsste, dem Schiff. Over 800 years ago, the Rambam wrote, just one action can be the one to bring redemption to the world. Now, those words really matter. We are now in a Geula age. Potential is lurking in every corner. Any one can be the one. The power of one mitzvah, the power of one moment. A single action has atomic power. But the Rebbe had given for Nesnutzen does in the good Richtung come with a clean camus mamas. Often a shinoi, but the shinoi is of the great and the regular chememre. Behold, I will be cool. If there is one some message of the Rebbe, it is this everyone can be the one, every moment can be. The <laughs> And what they do in the Kneppel, where the song comes to save Kolo Elam Kule, that's what we have to do for long time, not the most pshuto, as all unquetched in the past Kneppel, in the past Zeit, and then that's what we have to Pursue the possibilities, channel the occasions, turn your personal moments into a mitzvah opportunity for you and those who show up for you. The world must know of what is at stake and the responsibility of every person alive today to attempt all the buttons they possibly can. So the message is clear. The power of one. While we're talking about the power of one, I have the good fortune that the number one person in my life, my mother-in-law, Mrs. Kotlarski, is here. And um, 
we know that she was at least an equal partner in everything that went on throughout the world. So I'd like to open the evening with Rabbi Raleigh Resnick to please come up and address us. Just to mention that being a yeshiva bacher before I joined the Kotlarski family, and then once we joined, the Resnick family had a tremendous significance to us because Rabbi Raleigh's father, Dr. Resnick, was the Debbie's personal physician. And he came in as a very, very um, proper yeki from Washington Heights. And he came out as a very, very proper Chabad Chosid. That's what happens when you become the Debbie's doctor. And the end result is that one of your children, or a few of your children, become shluchim. That's just how it is. Rabbi Resnick, the floor is yours. Thank you. L'chaim, l'chaim. Rabbi and Mrs. Walla will accomplish a lot, but their greatest accomplishment has been that they're my shatchin. 20 years ago, my wife worked here, and uh, with free marriage counseling for a lifetime of marriage counseling, I want to thank you again. They'll get it, they'll get it. It's worth waiting for, I guess. We're good, don't worry. I have a loud voice, it's fine. It was Sukkot 1987. My brother and I were very well dressed because my mother, may she be well, was bringing us both to 1304 President Street to the Rebbe's house to visit the Rebbetson. I was a young boy. I don't remember much of the visit. I do remember there was an elevator in the house. And ever since then, I've always grown up and said, one day I'm going to have an elevator in my house. I remember the guard dog that was imposing. But it was at that occasion that the Rebbetson remarked and told my mother as follows. She said, my husband, referring to the Rebbe, will never be able to repay your husband, referring to my father, one of the physicians, for all that he has done for him. Now, please keep in mind, the Rebbe acted as a shadchan to my parents. He helped them buy their first home. He guided my father in his medical career and his research. He guided my parents on where to live and how to raise us. Practically everything we have came from the Rebbe. But nonetheless, the Rebbetzin, in her majestic humility, felt it such that she wanted to be makir toiv. She wanted to express her thanks and her appreciation. So I open tonight... And I'm very, very honored to be able to have the opportunity on Rabbi Katlarski Shloishim to give a thank you personally and heartfelt. Everything I am standing in front of you today has been a conduit through which the Rebbe through Rabbi and Mrs. Katlarski. I was just last night flipping through pictures of my parents' wedding where Rabbi Katlarski was the MC. My home, my bar mitzvah was in their home. And ever since then, literally I'm here today as a shliach because of them. And I'd like you to hold that thought for a moment. Because tonight on the Shloishim, which is 30, tonight is Gimel Tammuz. Which Gimel Tammuz? 30. The 30th year. It's not by chance that Rabbi Katlarski Shloishim and the Shloishim of Gimel Tammuz converge and coincide. We all know the famous Mishnah, Ben Shloishim Lekoyach. 30 is the symbol and the apex of the potential for energy. 
When the Leviim and the Mishkan were carrying this Mishkan through the desert, when did they have the strength to carry the Mishkan? When they turned 30. That's when we have the capability and the capacity to be able to bring holiness into a desert. And tonight, we talk about unleashing that power. And if there's a sign, a symbol of someone who was able to unleash that power and internalize it and spread it out and unleash it to the world, it was the dear Rabbi Kaplarsky. <sighs> You know, when the Hasidic movement was first getting started across Europe and spreading its wings, people were skeptical, they were weary, and the story sort of goes that there was Yankala, the simple, innocent wagon driver. And he had become a Hasid, and they asked Yankala, they said, Yankala, who's greater, Moshe or the Rebbe? And without batting an eyelash, he said, my Rebbe is greater. They said, aha, this confirms our suspicion. This confirms our skepticism. You see, this is leading people towards heresy. And then Yankala continued, and he said, you don't understand. The only way I know about Moshe Rabbeinu is because of my, my Rebbe. I'd like to tell you, on Thursday I was in Israel. I was in Israel because a young girl who grew up in our community, her father was not Jewish, she became a Balas Shuvah, and she got married to a beautiful Orthodox Jewish man building a Jewish home. Just yesterday, just yesterday, a young girl who grew up in our community, her parents refused originally to give us their phone numbers. She's now a Lubavitcher, and she yesterday had her firstborn boy, and she is, God willing, building a home. Her parents are actually here today. But I say this once, hold on one second, you're for a second. Both of these homes, these two couples are going to build homes of chesed, of kindness, open homes, homes that are dedicated to Yiddishkeit and to spreading Yiddishkeit. Do you know why? Because they grew up in our home. Our home that was a home where we had them Shabbos after Shabbos after Shabbos, when people would say, you should get a nap. Don't you have some time for private time? Have some family time. Don't just be totally, you know, give them, you need your space too. And do you know where I got that from? Because I grew up in the Katlarski home, and there was never private time in the Katlarski home. I grew up in a home, and I grew up in their home. Their home was that open home that was dedicated and open to everybody. And do you know why their home was like that? Because they were dedicated to the ideal of the Rebbe, who didn't sleep and didn't let anyone else sleep. They were dedicated to this idea. Look, one interaction. The Rebbe empowers one family, that empowers one shliach, that, that empowers. That is the way the Rebbe changes the world. That is the way we bring Mashiach. One interaction at a time, which spreads exponentially the world over. My father grew up in 1950s America. America was a little bit more of a melting pot. Today, everybody's into pride, ethnic pride, this pride, that pride. Everybody sort of keeps their indigenous names. You know, everyone then used to act a little bit more American. Today, you go to the doctor, you can't pronounce their name. You know, the Polish guy who goes to the DMV, they ask him to read the first line. He says, what do you mean read the first line? I know the guy, right? <laughs> Today, but when my father grew up, when my father went to work, he was an Orthodox Jew, but he did not wear a yarmulke. At work, when he saw patients, he didn't wear a yarmulke. I remember as a child, he would close his door for lunch. He would put on a yarmulke, make a bracha. But when he saw patients, he didn't wear a yarmulke. Now, my mother, many of you might know her, a balash tshuva has a certain zest and energy for life, a certain more of a, an enthusiasm, if you will. And at one point, there was another doctor. His name was Dr. Schuster from Florida. He was actually a plastic surgeon. And the Rebbe had encouraged him and said, you know, a man's face looks really beautiful when it has facial hair on it. You encourage people, your job is to make people look better. Well, you should start growing a beard. And my mother came to the Rebbe and said as follows, how come to Dr. Schuster, you encourage him to have a beard and to my husband, you don't even encourage him to wear a yarmulke at work? Now that takes an old chutzpah, but that, 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 was, that was what my mother came to the Rebbe with. And I'm not quoting verbatim, but the Rebbe said something to the effect of the following. The Rebbe said, I know your husband. When he wears a yarmulke, he's self-conscious. And as a physician, he's exercising his duty of arapa yarape to heal his patients. And him wearing a yarmulke is going to have an adverse effect on his ability to treat his patients. And that's the reason that I don't encourage him to wear a yarmulke because he might not be able to be as good a doctor. Okay? That's the end of part one of the story. Now, fast forward. President Bush Sr. had a medical condition and they couldn't diagnose it properly. They thought that my father 
would, as his expertise in hypertension, in endocrinology, they thought that perhaps he could consult on the case and they called him. As it should, should turn out, his wife actually had contracted Crohn's disease and I guess in the, act of, in the ultimate act of empathy, he actually also contracted Crohn's disease. Um, but that's actually what happened at the end. But they called my father from the White House to come and consult on the case. Now, my father, who had a personal relationship with the rabbi's secretaries, I don't know if it was Rabbi Klein or Rabbi Groner, but he had mentioned this to them in passing, and we get a call at the house. Call comes in. The rabbi has asked that when you go to see the president, you should please wear a yarmulke. Now, that is the end of the story, but I'd like to ask you a question. The Rebbe said that Dr. Resnick wearing a yarmulke is going to have an adverse effect on his ability to treat his patient. Now, unless the Rebbe didn't like Bush, <laughs> shouldn't that concern be exacerbated, exacerbated exponentially fold if your patient is the leader of the free world? What, 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 what's going on here? So hold that question in your mind, and I'd like to share with you one of the most beautiful letters. I read this letter quite often. It's a letter that the Rebbe penned six months before he formally assumed the position of Rebbe, six months after his father-in-law passed away on Yud Dalad Menachem of Tavshan Yud, 1950. It's a beautiful letter, and it's a letter that I think we all can live with, especially on this evening of Gimel Tamos. The letter is a five-paragraph letter. Paragraph number one is the dilemma, the question. Here's the question. There is a man, he's clearly a poor man. He is a shaykhet. In those days, the stockyards were leaving the cities and going out into the suburbs. His father has recently passed away and they had to take out loans for his burial. He has just gotten a position as a shaykhet. But if he takes the position, he will not be able to say Kaddish for his father. He'll be able to support his family and they'll be able to pay back the loans for the funeral. Should he take the job or not? That is paragraph number one of the letter. Paragraph number two. The Rebbe talks about the fact that in Jewish law, sometimes we make accommodations for supporting one's families. There are certain compromises that within the context of Jewish law are permissible if one needs to support one's family. Especially Kabbalistically, owing money for a funeral is something which is negative and should be paid off as soon as possible. Paragraph number three. You have brothers. That's far better than someone who's not related to say Kaddish. Your brothers are going to be able to say Kaddish for you. Paragraph number four, if you won't have a minion, be sure to give tzedakah before every service. Be sure to, to, to learn to study the Mishnayis. And if you can't lead the service, at least try to lead the Mezuman, try to lead the benching as much as possible. The Rebbe said in 1944, when my father passed away, I didn't, lead, I didn't make sure to lead the benching, but I was leading the service, so I don't have to. These are the first four paragraphs of the letter. If you were to conclude the letter here, we would clearly get the indication that the Rebbe is telling this individual to take the job. Paragraph number five. I write all of the above because I am not familiar with the state of your trust and belief in God. But if you will have pure, unadulterated trust and faith in God, then you will trust that he can provide Parnassah livelihood for you in a place with a minion and the Rebbe's signature. The reason this letter is powerful for me is the Rebbe is saying there are two modes of living. There are some times when one needs to make accommodations. There are some times when maybe you do need to take off your yarmulke. You're self-conscious. I understand that. And under normal circumstances, sometimes one can act that way. But there come certain times in life when the Rebbe asks us to step up to the plate when the Rebbe asks us, asks us to leave our comfort zone. Resnick, you can go to the president. You can feel comfortable wearing a yarmulke, represent the Jewish people, and be there for all of us. Tonight is Gimel Tamas. Tonight is the Shleishim of Rabbi Ketlarski. If there is an individual for me personally who represents the unleashing of this un unadulterated strength of the Rebbe, the ability to step up to the plate and to get it done, I remember when my father contracted the same illness that ultimately Rabbi Kadlarski passed away from 20 years ago, he, was, he had been sick for three months and Rabbi Kadlarski asked him if he could be the keynote, give the keynote address at the Kinnis. And my father, reluctantly so, I think Rabbi Kadlarski convinced him and told him, I think Joe Lieberman just canceled on us, we need you. I don't know what he told him, I don't remember. Um, and my father there, and his message was the thing he learned from Lubavitch. And talking, I think, a little bit about his personal connection with Rabbi Kadlarski is that failure is not an option. We have to get this done, we can get it done, and we will get it done. 
It was five years ago. It was the night before Tisha B'Av. I had fallen asleep on my couch downstairs, as I sometimes do, in the middle of Rambam or whatever I was studying. And my phone had become lodged in the pillows of the couch. And at one in the morning, it starts to ring. I look at the number. It's one of those generic phone numbers. And every bone of my body told me, don't answer this telemarketer. But I answered it. And the person said, hello, Mr. Resnick. Now, when someone says Mr. Resnick, that means it's a telemarketer. I didn't let the person finish. I said, do you know what time it is? And it was only then that she said, yes, I'm calling you because your building on Hopyard Road is up in flames, is on fire, referring to the Chabad house. I don't remember what I said. I ran up to tell my wife. I dashed out the door, drove like a maniac around the corner, and ran and started running towards the shul. I had seen pictures before. There were, feet, there were the videos, because when I got there, the flames had already subsided a bit. 50 feet in the air engulfed half the building, and I'm running into the building. The scrolls, the scrolls, you got to get us those scrolls. And they actually held me back, the firemen. They threatened me with arrest. It was reported on the news the next day. Rabbi threatened with arrest, trying to rescue scrolls. But I was able to verbally guide them to the Sifrei Torah and get them three Sifrei Torah safely into our van. What's remarkable about the story is how unremarkable this story is. Because the first thing that every single person in this room thought of when I said, a shul's on fire, if there are no people there, it's, did they get the Torah? Did they get the Sifrei Torah? Did they rescue them? Because you know, ladies and gentlemen, when the Torah, when things are on fire, we go into the mode of all hands on deck. We're there for the Torah. When there's an urgency, when there's an immediacy, we're willing to do anything. That's the mode of being, especially in these last few months that Rabbi Kedlarski tried to impart. It's 30 years of Gimel Tamos. There's an immediacy. There's an urgency in the air. What we do next can and will really save the Sifrei Torah. Our next act really does make a difference. I remember they would always ask my father to talk about the Rebbe. My father loved talking about nuclear magnetic resonance, imaging of intracellular ions. He could talk about that for hours. Talking about the Rebbe was not exactly his, uh, he didn't like it, but I remember once it was in Detroit, in the yeshiva, and Rabbi Shemtev asked him if he would please share some words. He couldn't say no. And one of the boys asked him, what was it like spending so many hours around the Rebbe? And my father said to the boys in Detroit, it's a rather insular yeshiva. He said, let me give you a football analogy. Not really, they might, might not get it. And he said, in a game, both teams, they play really hard. But then there's the two-minute warning. And both teams go into this mode of overdrive. Being around the Rebbe was like being around somebody who lived life after the two-minute warning. Overdrive. Every single moment makes a difference. If there's a night that that's true, it's tonight on Shloishim on 30 years. Ben Shloishim Lakoyach. There's a tremendous potential and energy in this room. And it's not just a cliche to say that the next act makes a difference. Rabbi Katlarski's last project was to get a million mitzvahs so that each and every Jew can transform the world in their little corner of the world. May that happen tonight. May we be able to celebrate the Shloishim and the Shloishim together with Rabbi Katlarski and the Lubavitcher Rebbe and all of the Rabbeim of Jewish history to come together to lead us towards Mashiach. That tonight we will see the unleashing of the ultimate Koyach, the Koyach that we've been for generations and generations saturating this world with the coming of the ultimate Bias Mashiach Tzitkenu, Bekarev Mamish. Rabbi Resnick, thank you very much. You were focusing on the Ben Shlishim Lekayach, 30 years for strength. My father-in-law of Asholom would always tell the story that his favorite rabbi, rabbi obviously, obviously, teacher, Rabbi, rabbi Isaac Shvei, was once walking with them in Montreal. And they were very close, a few yeshiva students. They were on or about 20 years old. An older Yidel walks over to them and quotes them the quote from Ethics of Our Fathers from Pika Yavis, Bukharim, Yeshiva students. What about observing the, the statement of the Mishnah ben Shmoyna Esrei Lechipa that at 18 years to get married? And without missing a beat, Rabbi Isaac Shrey responded, Rabbi Yid, what about observing the further quote of the Mishnah? Ben Esrim ben Aboyim Labina, that at 40 you meant to have a little bit of common sense. But Ben Shleisim Lukayach it is, and Yashakayach. So a few weeks ago, I had the good fortune to be at a community wedding in uh, Cleveland. Not only was I at a wedding, but we also managed to perform a double bar mitzvah there. There were two karkaftas that did not yet put on film in their life. They didn't know they were Jewish. And we had that. They're lucky I'm not a moyo. And um, <laughs> amongst, uh, in addition to 11 others who put on that night. And I met Ivan Silverman at the wedding. 
we have been talking amongst ourselves, my wife and I, um, as we're planning this event, that we've heard the Silverman name for years, for decades. And I went over to him at the wedding, and I asked if he would share his experience on how my father-in-law and mother-in-law had uh, brought him closer to the Rebbe, to Yiddishkeit, etc. And he gave me a condition. He said, if Yitzi will agree to do it, I will also. So I call Yitzi, another individual in this community, family lived in Alabama for a while, also close friends of my father-in-law and family. And I asked him if he would address the evening. He said, yes. I said, great, because it's a condition. If you do it, Ivan will. He says, I have one little issue. It's July 4th weekend, I'll be out of town. So tell Ivan, in theory, I'm addressing the evening. But in actuality, I will not be here. So Ivan, thanks for agreeing, despite the fact that Yitzi's not here today, to address us. We look forward to hearing and sharing, your sharing your experience. Ivan, thank you. To make a lachaim. Yeah. Okay, so of course, let's make a lachaim. Lachaim, lachaim. Rishus Rav. Before I um, begin, Rabbi Wallerweg told you who I am. I'm going to tell you who I'm not. Number one, I'm not a motivational speaker, and that was a very, very hard act to follow, Rabbi Reznik Shkayach. Number two, I'm not qualified to stand here and talk about the greatness of the Rebbe, the greatness of Rabbi Kadlarski. I was a uh, six, seven-year-old boy in Memphis, Tennessee when I first met Rav Moshe. I was a nine-year-old, very unhappy camper in Gan Yisrael when I first met the Rebbe. But I can tell you, I am qualified to tell you the impact that he had on my family. The other thing that I'm not is I'm not a shliach. Surprise. Um, but um, in my many travels through Chabad houses throughout the world, for Minyan, uh, it would always uh, come up in playing Jewish geography that I and my family was, were very close with Rabbi Kotlarski. As soon as I said that, I became this shliach's best friend. And I was shown the carpet that needs redoing and the chairs that needed remodeling. And so in a sense, I guess I was a shliach. My family story requires just a little bit of background. My family's journey to Yiddishkeit began in the late or in the mid-1960s in Nashville, Tennessee. My father, Olav Shalom was finishing saying Kaddish for his father. And at the end of that period, at the end of 11 months, the gravestone was, was put in the, the ground. My father looks at it and he says, it can't be, this cannot be the end. It's a slab of cold marble, this cannot be the end. And that began a lifelong friendship with Rav Zalman Posner of Nashville, Tennessee. Rav Zalman Posner started my father on his journey to Yiddishkeit and his relationship with the Rebbe. Years later, following the Rebbe's advice, Nashville was not a beacon of Judaism. Memphis was just slightly more so. But following the Rebbe's advice, my father uprooted his family 
and moved to Memphis, Tennessee. It was a very tough decision, both emotionally and financially. But as many letters that my family have from the Rebbe indicates, it was a critical and important decision. And it was most likely the reason that I'm standing here before you today. Rav Moshe Kalarski came down to Memphis in the early 70s, and I apologize to the Rebbitson, Libodel Ben Chaim Lachaim, going to talk about Rav Moshe, but the, the Kalarski's family impact on my family was very, very strong, and it, and it remains strong today. But Rav Moshe's influence on our life started when he came down to Memphis in the early 70s. He was instrumental in making sure that my older sisters continued on their path of true Torah values. My father was deeply committed to Hasidus, and Rav Moshe fostered that commitment, not only by acting as a conduit, relaying letters from my father to the Rebbe and letters back, but also by being a role model, in a sense, to my father. My father learned a lot from him. Yiddishkeit, Hasidus. And my father understood and learned very quickly what it meant to be a Hasid, devoting himself to the Ratzon of Hashem. On the long walk to, to Shul on Shabbos, it was a two-mile walk. It was uphill both ways. Very, very hot. But my father would tell me stories. I remember the book. He had a, a little red book called Tales of the Baal Shem Tov. And Rav Moshe gave him the book, gave him other books, gave him rec uh, records, Chabad Nigunim, that Sama Nashi, I remember as a little child hearing that. But my father would tell me stories of the Baal Shem Tov Tshul to make sure that I didn't whine and, and kvetch the entire way. And he would, he would leave it as a cliffhanger, so I would be good for the way back. But even as a boy of eight or nine years old, my father instilled in me what it meant to be yashar, what it meant to be honest, what it meant to be truthful. And those were the lessons that he got from Rav Moshe. My father was honest in business to, to the point where he was written up in, in local newspapers as being the store owner who would return merchandise to the factory because they gave him an extra piece. Or he would chase down, this was the days before computers, but he would chase down someone who he inadvertently overcharged by a few cents. And he would chase them down to return the money. His honesty in business and his pure approach to Yiddishkeit was a Kiddush Hashem, and it was a reflection on those who were his teachers and his influencers. Rav Moshe opened up his way of thinking and made him comfortable seeking and heeding the Rebbe's advice at every juncture and every important decision that he made. I'm going to, if you indulge me, I'm going to read a letter from the Rebbe in 5729, which was 19... 69, I believe. And my father was going through an uncertainty in terms of where to send his children to yeshiva. Memphis had a Jewish high school. It went to 12th grade. But uh, the decision where to go after, we didn't have a lot of money. To send to New York was a big, big decision. So he wrote letters to the Rebbe, which Rav Moshe facilitated. I don't have any copies of the letters, but I have copies of the, the, the Rebbe's reply. The Rebbe writes, after not hearing from you for a very long time, I received your letter of April 29th, which was reached to me after considerable, considerable delay. In it, you write, among other things, about the, continuous, the continuation of the education of your oldest daughter, Malka. Surely parents desire the maximum good for their children. And in light of this, it would be best for her to continue her education in an institution in which there is maximum Yerushalayim. Nowadays, especially 
when the influence of the street and general environment is so strong, remember this was 1969, it is necessary to instill into the children the utmost measure of Jewish values and the true spirit of Torah and mitzvot so that an adequate measure would remain at any rate, even allowing for the gravitational forces pulling in the opposite direction. Consequently, the atmosphere of the educational institution is of vital importance. And then he continues saying that my father should ask Rav Moshe for his advice. Truer words have never been said and they hold even more true today and it is how my wife was here with me showing her support. Uh, but it is how, <laughs> it, it, it is how my wife and I have raised our children. It's how my father raised us, and it's how we raise our children. Rav Moshe brought my father to Crown Heights around Purim time in 1976 to bake matzahs and get a bracha from the Rebbe. They had yechidas from, with the Rebbe that, was, that lasted about 11 minutes. Before they went in, they were told this is a two-minute thing. You go in, you go out, you nod your head, you walk backwards, boom. They were in there for a long time. The Rebbe's gabai or secretary kept poking his head in saying, you know, no, no. I don't know what was discussed at the meeting, but three weeks later, my father was nifter on Chalamoid Pesach. And Rav Moshe came down. He came down with matzahs baked Erev Pesach by the Rebbe to give to my father. And my father confided in Rav Moshe, and he told Rav Moshe that he wanted him to convey a message to the Rebbe, that, that my father had no tainas to the Rebbe, that he lived a full life, he lived a happy life, and he was happy for everything he had. My father was 47. The, the relationship with the Kalarsky family continued after that. We shared simchas. It continued with my mothers and sisters, my wedding, my son's wedding, my son's bar mitzvahs, and it continues, Baruch Hashem, today. The peros of that relationship has, Baruch Hashem, produced families, sons-in-laws and daughter-in-laws who are Yuri Shemayim, boys learning in, in yeshiva in Brooklyn, Lakewood, Farakaway, and Yerushalayim. We as a family, the Silverman family, and by extension, everybody who does not have the Silverman name, but uh, we remain deeply influenced by our roots and our connection to Chabad. The Ohel plays an important part in our tefillos, and we often find ourselves pulled in the direction of Chabad. My youngest daughter's birthday is actually tonight, Gimel Tammuz. And, uh, and, and that, was a, that was a delivery, if my wife would let me say so. It was a delivery that was, uh, it was not so simple. And it was a nace. And, uh, and her birthday was Gimel Tammuz. My sister was on an Air France flight to Israel in 1972. The Air France flight right after hers carried three terrorists who committed the Ludd Airport massacre just hours after she arrived. Her flight number on Air France was Air France 770. I was at the Ohel davening for my mother, and who should I run into on a random weeknight but Rav Moshe, who sat with me, he told me the tefillah to write, he told me the, the, the mimer to say, and he literally and figuratively held my hand through those trying moments of my mother's illness. As I said, he was in the hospital with my father, hearing his last words, and a few months back, I had the tremendous schus, unfortunately, to repay Rav Moshe 
to repay Rav Moshe's hospital stay with my father and be able to, at long last, verbally express the Hakaras Hatov on behalf of my entire family for the impact he had on all of us. May his neshama be a meilitz yosher for Achenu Beis Yisro. Thank you. I knew it was a good choice. Thank you very much. Class, my brother. Thank you, Ivan. And happy birthday for your daughter. I'd like to ask my brother, Chazen Mendel, to please lead with the Chassidah Shunigan. Please have something to say, L'chaim, something to eat, and then we will continue with our guest speaker, Chief Rabbi to Russia, Rabbi Beryl Lazar. As we move on to uh, Rabbi Lazar, we don't take it lightly to have the chief rabbi of the former Soviet Union, really, here with us today. And I will tell you 
Rabbi Lazar may not know this, but my love for shlichus and doing what my wife and I do every day was really impacted and influenced by Rabbi Lazar. You know, when we were younger yeshiva students in the 80s, Rabbi Lazar was in 770. His nickname was the KGB man amongst us because he was always going back and forth to Russia. I remember hearing about his early days in Russia today. Thankfully, there's Yiddishkeit in Russia and the Ukraine blossoming hundreds of Chabad centers, Jewish schools, orphanages, nursing homes, restaurants, supermarkets. I think there are even a few places for us to go on vacation as we are in the five towns. And we need to have that too everywhere in the world. But when Rabbi Lazar went as a yeshiva student, he actually slept, at least the way we heard it, on the bench in the mikveh. That was his royal master bedroom. When we came there the first time in uh, December of 1990, Rabbi Nebitz and Lazar were a young couple. In the early years of starting Shlichus, and we remember hearing about their struggles, financial struggles. You see, um, before the five towns, when we went out on Shlichus to Russia, there were two organizations, Ezazachim, that was known as the one that you struggled with, and Chama, we called them Chama tours, because everything was taken care of for you. They gave you money, they took care of you. And in a sense, we felt a little bit for, uh, more than just a little bit, for Rabbi Lazar's struggles. Going on, on a moment of the power of one, I'll share with you, I had, um, my wife and I spent time, obviously in separate cities, at least that's what we told my in-laws. Um, in Russia, I was there in December of 1990, and again in 1992, 93 for about eight months. And there was a, a student there, not yet a yeshiva student, and he befriended me. I was a yeshiva student, he was a yeshiva student. And at that time, there was no really, not really an organized thing of what happens first and second. We just did whatever we can do. We got the shul back. We started baking then uh, Pasi Yisrael bread. We had lavash. And for a while I had no milk, then I sent him to the farm, <coughs> excuse me, to get Chol of Yisrael milk, and I would give him Pasi Yisrael, and we had an exchange milk for bread three times a week. And that was life. And there was a trademark there. I'm not sure why it was only there, but it was there that we said loads of l'chaim. Like, I want a long Shabbos afternoon. It was ready in June. And this yeshiva student knew that I was going to leave in two, three weeks. We were on the 10th floor. That's where my apartment was, right across the street of the KGB building that the lights were off at that time, thank God. And we were fabrenging together. And in the middle of fabrenging, way into the afternoon, evening, I turned to him and I said, <coughs> what's going to be of you? I know you want to be a doctor. They have enough doctors in Russia. I said, how about this? You told me you want to be a doctor because your brother's a doctor. How about you go to Israel, become a mohel, you can come back and practice in the hospitals in Russia, and you'll be the mohel for Russian Jewry. He was after a little bit of l'chaim, or a little more than a little. I was after a little more than a little, and he gave me a, hand, a, sh a handshake, and he said, you got my words. Sunday morning, I come to shul for Minyan. I can't find him. By evening services, Min Chamaidev, he rolls in, white like a sheet, trembling, a hangover like, and he says, I said, um, do you remember the promise you gave me? He said, Rabbi Zalman, he says, how do you remember? I said, well, I did. I said, well, we're going to act on that now. He said, no, you got to be kidding. I have to go to medical school. He said, well, you gave me your word. And he says, you know what, you're right, I did. 
And we hooked him up with a mohel in Israel, and he went to Israel. Fast forward a few years, get married, and I'm in Florida in the airport with my older children at the time, <coughs> and there's this guy looking at me, staring at me. And I'm looking at him. Then I go over to him, I say, where do I know you from? It's funny the way you said it. Now that you're sober, you don't recognize me. Okay. Uh, I'm Shaya Shafit. I said, oh, Shaya. So nice. I said, so how is it going with your bris? And he says, well, actually, I'm on my way to a bris now, thanks to you. That was nice. In the year 5770, he was interviewed in Israel. And he said, Salman Wallowick, wherever you know, wherever you are, just know that you are an equal partner in the 5,770 brishim that I did. Well, a few months ago, about a year ago, got on one of these WhatsApp groups a picture of Shaya Shafit standing next to a sign, an individual and a sign next to them, number 8,000. And I write back to him, what a nachas, you see the power of the Rebbe, that he sent a yeshiva student to Russia, and here you are, and he writes back in a one-liner, we are equal partners. I was just one yeshiva student. There was no real organized system in Russia. It was chaos. But when we went as a shliach, with the power and brach of the Rebbe, the impossible becomes possible. And today, thankfully, some, most of the times we don't see results, in this case we did. Well, Rabbi Lazar, when we first got married, Rabbi Lazar's name was a household name. My in-laws were very involved in seeing, looking after the success of getting Yiddishkeit, Judaism, up and running in Russia. Rabbi Lazar was on the ground, and my father-in-law had tremendous merits to get directors from the Rebbe in his involvement there. Today, Rabbi Lazar is chief rabbi of Russia, spearheads hundreds of Chabad centers, Jewish schools, and the list goes on and on. Without further ado, Rabbi Lazar. Good evening. <clears throat> I must admit that if this wouldn't be an evening for and connected to Rabbi Kutlarski, I wouldn't be visit you, I wouldn't be visiting you, I would be sitting by the ale in these special hours, a day that every moment that we can be near the Rebbe is surely crucial and will surely have an effect on our future. But yes, Rabbi Kutlarski was a person that was very, very close and dear to me. And when Rabbi Zalman called me and asked me, can you join us? The answer was, of course, I'll be there. So as much as I would like to begin with Rabbi Kutlarski, I think we all have to think and try to understand what is the Rebbe asking from us tonight, what is expected from us at this moment, 30 years from Gimel Tammuz, and what is Lubavitch all about? I remember when I first came to America to learn, this was 1980, there was a Fabrengen, a new Shvat, the day that the Rebbe always spoke about the previous Rebbe. It was exactly 30 years from the passing. 
of the Friedrich Rebbe, famous Febrengen when J.B. Soloveitchik came to the Febrengen. And the Rebbe then spoke about Vayhi Bishleishim Shona. What do 30 years actually mean? And as the aftermath of that Febrengen, there were many, many more Febrengens where the Rebbe turned to the Chassidim and he said, Vayhi Bishleishim Shona Kiflaim Litushia. We have to redouble our efforts. I think only the Rebbe expected from Chsidim, from all Jews around him, every once in a while, not just to add something new, but the minimum that you'll do, redouble the resources, redouble the results, you have to make a real change. So tonight we're speaking about one action, and a regular day I would say that's an amazing message. I think tonight, for all of us, seeing what's going on in the world, what's going on in Israel, is a moment that maybe, yes, we have to think of the words of the Rebbe when it was 30 years to the passing of the Friedrich Rebbe, of the previous Rebbe, if I would have a good voice, I would be, together with you, I would teach you a song that I heard that that Fabrengen, and the 770 was shaking, rocking, jumping, the walls were shaking. More or less it was, and we all knew that no matter what, we're going to redouble our efforts. The question comes, how do you energize people? How do you turn the small, little Lubavitch into this worldwide organization that it's today? And how do you expect such growth on and again and again? So I want to share with you a story that happened with Rabbi Kotlarski. I know Rabbi Kotlarski is with us tonight, and I know she loves this story, so I'm going to repeat it again. It starts in 1991. The Soviet Union is still strong and running. And some shluchim in Europe, who used to gather every few years, and the kinos shluchim of the European emissaries, decided, and was actually somebody's idea, that maybe it's time, instead of gathering in Milan, London, Paris, that's easy, let's gather in Moscow. And to make a long story short, 130, 140 shluchim traveled from all the cities around Europe to a keynote that took place in Moscow, in Lubavitch, in Almata, where the resting place of the Rebbe's father. Lubavitch is a city, you can say, where the Lubavitch organization actually, for many years, had its headquarters. And at that keynote, actually, I spoke about it many times. The Rebbe handily appointed Rabbi Kotlarski to be his representative at that kinus, at that conference. And there were many stories at that kinus, miracles upon miracles, things that nobody could imagine that even could happen. One of the most amazing moments was Shabbos morning in the center of Moscow, 130 rabbis walking with their talesim, escorted by the police, the same police that used to be the enemy of the Jewish people, the enemy of the Chassidim, they were actually protecting these rabbis. When the Rebbe heard about it from Rabbi Kotlarski on the phone, the Rebbe was shocked. The Rebbe couldn't even imagine that such a thing is even possible. Of course, the Rebbe knew, but he, his words that he used at that moment, azaygor, azaygor, that's how really that happened. That far? that 130 rabbis were walking in the streets of Moscow for over an hour, escorted by the police, it was a very special conference. The last day of the conference, Rabbi Kotlarski got a message from the Rebbe. And more or less the message was, 
was excellent that you visited Lubavitch, was great that you visited Moscow, Almata. But the Rebbe asked, they should also go and visit the city of Liozhnya and Liadi, the birthplace of the Alter Rebbe, and the city where he lived. The rabbis were already practically on the way to the airport, going back to their hometowns, changing tickets, arranging such a trip to Liozhnya and Liadi, it was practically impossible. Rabbi Kutlarski wanted very much to do it, but the rabbi said, we're all going back home. And even though everybody heard that this is the desire of the rabbi, it was practically impossible. So every year when I used to meet Rabbi Kutlarski by the kinos at other events in their home, which was always open for anyone, he always used to tell me, do you remember what the rabbi asked us to do? We have to go visit Liozhna and Liadi. We have to go back and visit Liozhna and Liadi. Year after year, we remember that somehow we have to make this trip to Liozhna and Liadi. We have to make this conference. And he didn't give up. And 25 years after that kindos, we actually arranged a new conference of Shluchim. And the plan was to finally fulfill the Rebbe's desire to go visit Liozhna and Liadi, where it all started. Those were the Rebbe's words where Lubavitch started. You ask me, why did the Rebbe want us, the Shluchim, to go visit the small villages who aren't even on the map? If you're gonna try to look on Google, you won't find them. It's two little cities, one smaller than the other, maybe some chickens, maybe a few cows, and there might be one or two people living there today, but it's really non-entity. But the Rebbe wanted that. You have to go back where it all started. And that's what was arranged. The whole kinnus, Baruch Hashem, at that time, there were over 500 shluchim that came to visit Russia. We went again to Lubavitch, Moscow, Almata. But the plan was, after the visit in Lubavitch, we'll go visit Liozhna and Liadi. Lioz Lubavitch is in Russia. Liozhna and Liadi is in Belarus, White Russia. Happens to be two different countries. So everything was planned, everything was arranged, buses, transportation, food. And the plan was that we're going to go visit Liozhna and Liadi on Sunday of the Kinnus. Thursday, I get a phone call from the governor of the Smolensk region, and he tells me, I heard you're planning to visit Liozhna and Liadi. I want to let you know that as much as we're very happy and honored to host these 500 rabbis, but crossing the border from Russia to Belarus, it's impossible for foreigners. Any foreigner that wants to get into Belarus, he has to fly into Minsk. Now, to get a flight, go back to Moscow, and fly everybody from Moscow to Minsk, and then from Minsk, go to Lyozhna Liadi, go back to Minsk, go back to Moscow. Again, this was impossible. I called Rabbi Kutlarski and tell him, what should I do? He says, you have connection, you'll take care of it. Don't worry, go ahead. <laughs> okay, I have connection, I'll take care of it. I start calling the fire ministry. They tell me it's impossible to do it. You just can't do it. There's no border. You can't cross the border that doesn't exist. I call people in the presidential administration. They tell me, I'm sorry, we can't help you. And until Shabbos, I was on my phone calling and calling and trying to get somebody to help us, and everybody said, it's not going to happen. Forget about it. Of course, Rabbi Kotlarski was already in Russia, landed before Shabbos. We had an incredible Shabbos. Right after Shabbos, we got into buses. We went to Lubavitch, which is a few hours away from Lyozhna Liadi. We got there in the morning. It's Sunday morning. I understand if we didn't manage to get permission on Thursday and Friday, Sunday is not a working day. It's not going to happen. But we all have a flight from Moscow to Almaty the next day. We have only one day to visit Lubavitch, Lyozhna and Liadi. And this is Sunday. We are there in Lubavitch, and everybody thinks that we are going to go to Lyozhna and Liadi. Besides Rabbi Kotlarski and myself, who know that this is actually impossible to do. But everybody came, these 500 rabbis came, because they wanted to fulfill the Rebbe's request to go visit these two cities. You're going to let them down? So we are there in Lubavitch after we daven, 
and we were by the resting places of the Tzemach Tzedek and the Rabbi Marash. We had a big Fabrengen, and uh, Rabbi Zalman mentioned that in Russia, in his days, they used to say some Lechaim. Well, it's still around this uh, custom and this Minag. Every once in a while, we say Lechaim. You see the size of the bottles in Russia. That's every person that sits on the table he gets us a bottle. <laughs> so we said a lot of Lechaim. There was a lot of Lechaim in that Fabreng in Lubavitch. For many, most of the Shluchim was the first time in their life that they visited the small city, the city of Lubavitch. And we all know that we're going to go to Lyosh Neliadi. At a certain point, I turn to Rabbi Kotlarsky and I tell him, what are we doing? We have to make some kind of announcement. So he says, announce that we are going now to Lyosh Neliadi. Rabbi Kotlarsky asks, and it's a command. I got up on the podium, I announced, Please, everybody, board the buses. We are going to Lyozhne Liadi. And me and Rabbi Kotlarski went into a car because we realized we have to figure out what we're going to do once we get to the border. <laughs> we get into the car and we get a message from the people that were standing by the border and they tell us, used to be bad, it's much worse. You have the KGB, I won't give you all the names, FSO, the police, the border guard, the, K, the first bay, on and on, standing by the border, you have tens of guards, all with video cameras, and uh, they're going to record every step that every person is going to do. It's impossible to cross the border. So I tell Robert Kotlarski, do you realize we're going to come there at the border with 500 people, there's no border, and they're watching and they're not going to let us through on this road. He says, we're going to the border. Okay? We're going to go to the border. We get to the border. You have 500 shluchim after a lot of l'chaim <laughs> coming out of the buses. And the scene was incredible. Dancing, singing. Sure, that we're going to cross the border. And all of a sudden, we had to let them know that, please, wait. We're waiting for permission. Permission from who? Permission how? Where? When? And I'm sitting in the car with Rabbi Kotlarski. We both had some l'chaim also. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I get a phone call. The head of the presidential administ administration is on the line. And he tells me, Rabbi Lazar, you called me around two weeks ago, and I finally found time to call you back. Is there anything that you needed to ask me at that time? And this was after a little of L'chaim, and I tell him, actually, what I wanted to ask you two weeks ago, I don't remember, <laughs> but I have a new request. And I tried to describe to him the scene that is happening. We are here by the border, 500 shluchim, and they're not going to let us in. And could you imagine what's going to happen all over the world? These rabbis are going to go back and say, this is the way they treat rabbis in Russia today. And he tells me, listen, it's not about Russia. It's about international agreements. There's no border that you can cross. I tell him, listen, I understand everything. In Russia, they say every rule has an exception. We need this exception. So he says, you know what? Give me 20 minutes. Exactly 20 minutes later, we're sitting in the car. Somebody knocks on our door, and he says, and this is after they told us, you're not going to cross the border, and the police, and the f everybody told us, you're never going to cross this border. And they tell us, you know what? We have no idea how this happened, but you got permission to go in, but there's no way you're going to get permission to get out. <laughs> and I tell this to Rabbi Kotlarski, and he says, we're going in. <laughs> we'll figure out if we're going to get out, not going to get out. The Rebbe wanted us to go to Lyosh Neliadi. We're going to Lyosh Neliadi. Everybody board the buses. We are crossing the border. We went in, and in Lyosh actually, and the Liadi, people gathered from all over, all the small, I don't know, villages, fields, everybody was there. They opened the market for us. They thought these rich Americans came now, that we're going to buy off whatever they have to sell. And the president of Belarus sent a letter, a special messenger, saying that it's the honor of their country, that the Alter Rebbe was born in their country over 250 years ago, and now hosting those that are following his teachings. 
was an incredible kinnus in the central square, if you call that a square, in Liozna. And then we traveled to Liadi. We were planning to be there in the morning hours, but the time we got to Liadi was dark. I remember Rabbi Kotlarski standing there with a small flashlight, 500 shluchim around him, and saying to him and speaking to the shluchim. A few weeks later, I met the head of the presidential administration. I asked him, tell me the truth. How did you do it? How did you manage to pull it off in 20 minutes? And how did you know it was going to take 20 minutes? He says, I'll tell you the truth. I was actually on my way to see the president, and I remember that he had called me two weeks before. I decided, you know what, I have two minutes, I'm going to call him back. This is Sunday. I called you, and when you told me what's going on, I decided the only one that can take care of this is the president. I went to the president's office, he heard the request, he called the president of Belarus, and they made an agreement that once, first and forever the last time, they're going to allow foreigners to cross from Russia into Belarus. The next week in the paper, there was a big article saying that never again will they allow people to cross this border. <laughs> now you think of the Ashgocha Protis, the chances of the president, head of the administration, calling me because I had called him two weeks before. Walking into the president, the president deciding to call the Belarusian president and making sure that the shluchim should come in. Now, how did Rabbi Kotlarski believe all along that this is going to happen? The answer is probably a very strange medrash. Shleim HaMelech says in Koheles, Pesi Hamaimin Lechol Dover. Somebody gullible believes everything. And the Medrash says, who is this person who's gullible and believes everything? That's Meishe Rabbeinu. Meishe Rabbeinu is the person who's the most gullible person on earth and believes everything. And the Rebbe asks, are we trying to make fun of Meishe Rabbeinu as a gullible? He's the leader of the Jewish people. All they have to say, the Medrash can say, he's the most gullible person. So before I'll give you the Rebbe's answer, I want to share with you another story that happened in Russia. I won't go on for the whole night with stories, but I could. 1991, Rabbi Zalman brought me back to these memories of those days. Everything was chaotic. By the way, not only Lubavitch, in the country also. And I was actually visiting the state because my wife had just given birth to our second daughter. In the middle of the night, the phone rings. My mother-in-law picks up the phone, and she comes and wakes me up, and she says, Beryl, there's something crazy going on. I don't know what they're talking about. They're just screaming. You must get the phone. I get onto the phone and actually hear people screaming, panicking, screaming at me. Where are you? What's going on? I have no idea what they're talking about. Talking about August 1991, and they're not even making sense of what they're screaming on the phone. By the time I figured out and I calmed them down, I found out that there was a coup going on in Russia. The communists took over the army, everything else that was running in Russia at that time. Gorbachev was arrested, tanks in the streets, as they say, balagan, chaos. And they're telling me on the phone that every Jewish organization left already. They're on the way to the airport or they're already on planes. Every foreign office closed down. And they tell me we have camps running. We have hundreds of kids, parents that are calling us and telling us what's going to be. And the parents of the counselors that came from Israel, America, are also calling us. Tell us what to do. What should I do? What should I tell them? Close the camps, run to the airport. Stay put. How can I take such responsibility? So I told them, listen, this is not a question for me. It's a question for the Rebbe. Now it's 5 o'clock in the morning. Give me a few hours. I'm going to go to 770. I'm going to ask the Rebbe what to do. So I came to 770. 15 minutes before davening, I gave him the letter explaining exactly what's going on. The phone call, the camps, 
And I wrote to the Rebbe, me and my wife and our two daughters are actually planning to go back to Russia tonight. Should we change our plans? Everybody's leaving, and we're going to fly to Russia. Fifteen minutes later, the Rebbe comes down to Shachris, and the Rebbe secretary is following the Rebbe. I don't know if it ever happened before. All of a, I see that he's looking around. All of a sudden, I stand there. He comes over to me, and he tells me there's an answer from the Rebbe. You won't believe the answer. The minute Shachris is over, come up to my office. The Rebbe took his time before Shachris. We can imagine how the Rebbe prepared for Shachris to answer a letter that came from Russia. And he tells me it's an incredible answer. Of course, I was there before Shachris finished. I was already waiting in his office. And I'll repeat the answer of the Rebbe. Just so you should understand, the news was saying that they're shooting in Moscow, the tanks are in the street, the Pentagon, the White House, nobody knew what's going to happen. The American president said, we have no clue what's going to happen the next hour or two. They might press on the nuclear button. Nobody knew what's going to happen. Chaos completely. They took over the government, just regular people, communists, took over. And I get the answer, and the Rebbe writes. I say it first in Hebrew. Betimoin achi godel kibalti ashaile. Keposhut sheyamshichu bechol ha'inyonim kelel hakaitones ad gemira v'ashem yatzlichem ve'ivasru toiv askir alatziyen. I'll try to translate it into English. It would be Russian, it would be a little easier. The Rebbe says, I'm shocked by the question that you're asking. I'm flabbergasted you're asking such questions. I received this question, I don't understand where is this question coming from. It's obvious that you have to continue everything, including the camps, until you finish, and God will give you much success, and you're going to be able to send and report good news. And I'm going to mention what you wrote about at the Syrian of the Friedrich Rebbe. Now, of course, the minute that I got that phone call, I called the camp and, he, and I told them, camp is running as usual, business as usual, nobody's leaving, not one child should leave that camp. Talking about people that changed, one of the boys in that camp actually had a bris with Rabbi Shafit, if I'm not mistaken, maybe it was already still Binyamin, in any case, and became a Rosh Yeshiva in our Yeshiva, a result of that camp. An amazing family. They have Kenanora today, I think, 11 children, beautiful family, a Shliach, actually a boy that was in that camp. And the question that I always ask myself, I understand that the Rebbe knew what would happen, but nobody knew. We had to fly back to Russia. I remember getting to the airport and my mother-in-law tells me in secret, don't tell Khani, don't tell your wife, but what they're saying on the news is really scary. They're shooting people in the streets. The tanks going around the streets of Moscow, but I know that you have to fly back. The Rebbe told you to fly back. People were telling me, wait a day, wait two days. I said, the Rebbe says not to change anything. How could I change my flight? We flew from Frankfurt to Moscow. It was actually an amazing flight. The passengers were less than the pilots and the stewardess. It was me, my wife, our two daughters, and one more person. <laughs> Years later, I met this person. I asked him, why were you flying to Moscow? He says, my wife called me, and she said, you get into the next flight, or it's a divorce right now. And we were a family flying into Russia. We got to the airport. The airport was packed with people trying to leave. And we arrived to Moscow. Of course, we all know the end of the story. 12 hours later, everything was done, taken care of. Nobody knew how, what, when. But of course, one of the nevuas of the Rebbe, the Rebbe that Shabbat, Shabbat Sheftim actually spoke about nevua. One of the prophecies, the Rebbe said, nothing to worry about, go back. All this makes sense. We are used to it. But I'm always wondering, what is the Rebbe telling me? 
that is shocked by the question. I wasn't supposed to ask. What was I supposed to do? Tell everybody, continue, everything is fine. Tanks are nothing for us. We are Lubavitchers. How could the Rebbe tell you that he can't figure out what is the question all about? And maybe the answer is the Lubavitch Rebbe. There's a famous story of a child coming back home after the Rebbe spoke to the children, the rallies, and the father asks him, what did the Rebbe say? And he turns to his father and says, the Rebbe said that Mashiach is coming. And the father turns to his son and he says, that's all you heard from the Rebbe? I've been telling you this all along. What did the Rebbe say in you? He says, yes, but the Rebbe believes that. Pesi Maimi Lecholdover is somebody who's a Muna, who's Bitochen, who's assured that what the Abishta is going to do is going to be amazing. It's going to be for the best. Sometimes we have questions, but we have no doubts. The Rebbe told us, Tavshinun is going to be a year of miracles. Nun Aleph is going to be a year that is going to show us miracles. And all of a sudden, this young shliach turns to the Rebbe and he says, should we close the camps? Should I not go back to Russia? The Rebbe says, are you crazy? Are you listening to what I've been telling you? I'm shocked that you're asking such questions. Of course you continue. Of course you stay put in Russia. And 30 years later, when the special operation broke out, as you all know, probably you read, you heard, many rabbis left. I would say practically all rabbis besides Lubavitch rabbis. In Ukraine, every shliach is there. In Russia, every shliach stayed. Not one shliach left Russia at the same time when many different organizations said, these are not kind of days that we can live in Russia. Let's leave. Well, if you don't feel shlichus, if you don't feel what the Rebbe is telling us, the Mashiach is coming, of course you're going to leave. It's not the career that you envisioned. And the Rebbe tells you, you're going to stay there until it's over. Ad gemira. Until it's finished, you're going to stay there. Continue. V'ashem yatzlichem. And Hashem is going to bless you with much success. V'vas rutoiv. If you ask me, of course, when the Rebbe says, the pesi maimin l'choldover, the gullible one that believes in everything, because his belief is so strong, it's higher than understanding, and that's Meshe Rabbeinu. I think that our Rav Meshe Kotlarski, I'm sorry if I'm going to insult someone, he was very gullible. Trust me, when he told me to go to the border because he was gullible. He didn't understand what Russia is. He didn't understand what a border is. He just believed, the Rebbe said we have to go. We're going to go. What's the question? How, what, when, where? That's a different story. You'll figure it out. The Rebbe will figure it out. Rabbi Kotlarski... He knew how to cover it up, but he was very gullible. He believed the one more action is going to bring Mashiach. He really believed in what the Rebbe believed. And that was his drive. That's why he believed that we can change the world and bring Mashiach. Until his last breath, he believed the Mashiach is going to come. And why did he believe that? Because he felt that's what the Rebbe told him that he has to do. So tonight, I think, we all have to become gullible. We all have to become believers, not only in miracles. Miracles we see day and night. Today became part of our life. When we see what's going on around, and we see what's going on in Israel, and we could ask many questions. If you read the news, you're shocked. How could this have happened? How could we look at this and still believe Actually, the Rebbe tells us now you have to start believing. Now you have to believe the power that you have to bring a change. This happened to wake us up and tell us there's a vacuum. People are hurting. People are suffering. You have to double your efforts. You have to be there and help every single Jew. Believe even more. Do even more. 30 years ago, at the Fabrengen that I mentioned in the beginning of my short talk, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. I'm also gullible. I don't look at watches. <laughs> and I still believe people are going to stay and listen. 
Anyways, 30, 40, four years ago, at that Fabrengen, the Rebbe said, it's not about learning more. Of course, learning is the most important thing. And of course, teaching is the most important thing. The Rebbe said, we need action. What are you ready to do? 30 years to double your efforts. Are we ready to undertake to double our efforts? This is what the Rebbe is expecting from us. And I think that if you would have Rabbi Katlarski in this room now, and I'm sure he's here, but he is asking us to say what he would like to tell us is there's actually moments, seconds before Moshiach's coming, and it depends on us. It depends on what we're going to do. If we see the miracles that have happened in the Soviet Union, in Russia, I mentioned one of the few miracles Rabbi Kotlarsky was part of because of his belief, it was something that I keep on repeating. Miracles happen to people that believe in miracles. If at the time of Hanukkah, they wouldn't have gone into the Beit Samikdash to light the menorah when there was no oil, the miracle would have not have happened. Hashem wouldn't have made the miracle unless they believed that it's worth lighting these candles. The miracle by Yamsuf, by the Red Sea, happened because somebody jumped into the water. He wouldn't have jumped, the miracle wouldn't have happened. Not only do we have to believe in miracles, we are sure that miracles happen and will happen once we'll believe in them even more. And the greatest miracle that we're all waiting for, the coming of Mashiach, is going to happen. Be'ezra Hashem tonight, that Gimel Tam is going to become the biggest holiday. The holiday of the Geula, Mitis Vashlema, and that it depends on each one of us to redouble our efforts to make sure the Mashiach will come now. Thank you. My passion this year is that a Mashiach ben David Boel at Bidur Shekulay Zakai. This is a call to action that there should be not one Jew that does not do a mitzvah this year. When I was not feeling well, I thought, what present could we give to the Rebbe? Our present to the Rebbe has to be to change the world into a world of Kulai Zakai. We can't be complacent with what is going on. It is so many years since Gimel Thomas, so many years since Chavzai and other. If you are a head of state, a head of country, a head of city ahead of a community. It is your obligation to see that each and every Jew, regardless where he is, gives a penny to tzedakah, does a mitzvah. If you take 10 people and say with them every day, Give a penny to Tzedakah, it's Abbas Yisrael, it's the end of Tzedakah. We could accumulate hundreds of millions of mitzvahs. And the Rebbe can tell the Almighty God, it is 28 years already since Gimel Thomas. And look, my shluchim, my chsidim, all of my chsidim, all of my shluchim, look what they're delivering me. And every one of us has to undertake to see and to do his part that there is not one Jew, not one Jew in the world that is not going to do a mitzvah to make this a world of Kulei Zakai so that we be, should be reunited with the Rebbe speedily in our days. Bebiyas, Mashiach, Sidkenu, B'mhei Rabbi Amenu Mamash. I do want to mention the One Mitzvah campaign. I'm Andy Tilden, and I'm Mashiach in Comac, New York. One Mitzvah is a crowd-raising platform, but instead of raising funds, you actually raise mitzvahs. It's very similar to the platforms that we're all familiar with where we raise money, but this time, it's mitzvahs instead. I found One Mitzvah to be an amazing platform, and whether you're a shliach or not, I think you will too. It's super easy for anyone to make their own campaign. 
The site is already preloaded with about 30 different campaigns for almost any life cycle event that you could think of. You log in, put in some basic info, and voila, you are ready to start collecting mitzvahs. Rav Moshe launched this platform, his final project, as a way to encourage all Yidim to add even one more mitzvah, which will ultimately hasten the coming of Mashiach speedily in our days. Amen. So as we reach the conclusion, the culmination of this evening, the One Mitzvah campaign, please make the most of it. I do want to mention that today, our county executive, the Baruch Bruce Blakeman, sent us a proclamation. And basically he's proclaiming the ninth day of July, 2024, to be recognized as Rabbi Menachem M. Schneerson Day. We are honored, privileged, is our schus and kavod, that um, recognizing this day and recognizing the Rebbe as this day. Wanted to thank all of, wanted to thank all of the rabbis, Rabbi Resnick, our chief rabbi to Russia, Rabbi Lazar, also the rabbis who were present here, Rabbi Zakatinsky, Rabbi Einhorn of Swan Lake, my personal Rav in order to ask it. Rabbi Mendel Gordon, Chabad of Yulet Old Woodmere, Rabbi Pesach Shmerling, Chabad of Rockaway. I'd like to ask Chazen Mendel, Achsida Shanigan, who will be followed by Maidav. Yeah. Adam is perfect. Hello, Adam.
Yeah, I'm a man. 